you know, we should use the mics because they're doing. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, these don't really amplify, do they? The, the, a little bit? Okay, good. Well, welcome. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. It's uh, so really cool to look around and see so many great faces in the room. Um, it's a real honor for me personally, and I, I know for all of us here at the Goodman, to host this conversation uh, about the Latino Theater Commons uh, here at the Goodman. Um, you know, um, many, many, many years ago, um, Teatro Vista did a co-production with the Goodman of Jose Rivera's Cloud Tectonics, and I believe that was 1995. And um, ever since then, um, it's, you know, I think kind of been um, a privilege for me to um, be what I, you know, tell some people is like in the belly of the beast uh, mm. here at, at the Goodman, uh, <laughs> sort of advocating on behalf of Latino artists and uh, new Latino work. And it's, um, it's been a great privilege. And, and so it's a real honor to host this conversation here. Over the years here at the Goodman, we've um, had the privilege to work with a lot of the writers in this room, a lot of the actors and artists in this room, uh, and then to host the Latino Theater Festival for the last 10 or 12 years or so, expanding sort of the, the notion of what uh, Latino theater might and could be in this country to include translation, to include international work, and certainly to create the space here at the Goodman and in Chicago for our brothers and sisters around the country as well. Um, but now I feel like the time has come for, um, you know, something a little bit more formal or a little bit more organized nationwide. And it's incredibly gratifying to see what has been happening over the last year, and, and, and then especially what happened this fall in Boston. <laughs> and so we have four people, yeah, right? Um, so we have four people with us here this morning that many of you may know. I'll just quickly introduce Ricardo Gutierrez over here to my left, who is... Uh, Ricardo is the artistic director of Teatro Vista here in Chicago. He's a fabulous actor, fabulous director, and great all-around human being. Uh, Lisa Portez over here to my left as well. Lisa is the head of the MFA directing program at the theater school at DePaul University and a fabulous director as well. To my right is uh, Anne Garcia Romero. Anne is a playwright and an assistant professor at Notre Dame University. Yeah. Anne, welcome. <laughs> and to Anne's right is uh, Tlok Rivas. Uh, Tlok is a, an associate professor, assistant professor. Assistant. He's a professor <laughs> uh, at uh, University of Iowa and is also a freelance director, a fabulous director, and an also great all-around human being. And it, just thrilled to have these four people here. Um, Tlaloc, um, Anne, and Lisa are founding members, I guess you would say, of the Latino Theater Commons, and um, they have created a sort of a format about how to talk about what happened in Boston and also to start talking about what the future looks like. So I think at this point, I am going to turn it over to Anne to tell us a little bit about the history of the Latino Theater Commons. Great. Anne? Well, thank you so much, Henry, and thank you to the Goodman for hosting this wonderful conversation this afternoon. And we're really thrilled to be here and to see this wonderful work all weekend. Um, and so this initiative began with an idea from Karen Zacarias, a wonderful playwright who's been produced here at the Goodman Theater, who is at the arena stage as a playwright in residence. And she had this dream to have a gathering of a small gathering of Latino theater artists to talk about the state of the field, what's happening, um, how are we going to talk about the future of the field. And so eight of us came together in May of 2012 in DC and had a meeting together where we brainstormed, we discussed, we talked, we planned, we dreamed, and we came up with an idea to form what we call the Latina Latino Theater Commons. And the idea was to create a uh, initiative that would advocate for U.S. Latina and Latino theater artists and scholars around the country to connect us, to connect the various communities around the country that were already organizing um, on their own, and really to be a platform to celebrate the diversity of work in the community and to really 
really bring to the American theater at large um, our vision for a multicultural, multi-layered, complex Latino, Latino theater community and the work that comes from this community. Um, so we had this vision, we, we met, we uh, came up with a, a plan to implement the vision and the plan was to have five initiatives. The first initiative was to have a national convening in Boston in 2013 to kind of gather a select group of folks to meet and begin this conversation on a national level. Um, we also had a vision to have in 2014 an encuentro of Latino theater companies in Los Angeles at LATC, um, the Los Angeles Theater Center, to basically find a way to talk about aesthetics and look at 10 companies from around the country. Um, our next initiative is 2015 here in Chicago um, at DePaul University to have a carnaval of new Latino Latina work. So readings of plays to celebrate the new work in our community. And then the fifth initiative, and I want to get this name completely correctly, um, is the uh, Maria Irene Fornes Center for the Advancement of Latina Latino Theater. So we'll hear more from folks about those initiatives in a few minutes. I also wanted to mention briefly that um, uh, the Commons, um, we are supported by HowlRound, which is an organization in Boston now at Arts Emerson, um, and it's directed by Polly Carl. And also David Dower is the head of the artistic programming at, at the Arts Emerson, and they have given us support, guidance, um, insight as to how to organize ourselves and how to really come together as a community to bring these visions into reality. Um, I also have to mention um, most definitely Jamie Galoon, who is the associate director of HowlRound, Jaime. who has been, Jaime Galoon, um, she has been <laughs> our amazing uh, uh, inspiratress, um, someone who's helped us with orga organizing, guiding, um, so she's been an amazing force as well. Um, and so just briefly, when we had the initial vision, we came back together in the fall of that year and formed a steering committee of about 20 members from across the country of various companies, universities, to begin to expand the conversation. Um, some of those companies included members from Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Center Theater Group, Steppenwolf, El Teatro Campesino, the Hip Hop Theater Festival, and Aurora Theater in Atlanta. Um, schools included USC, Brown, DePaul, University of Iowa, Princeton, UCLA, and University of Notre Dame. And so we got together um, in March of 2013, a year later, to plan this national convening. We got a grant from the Doris Duke Foundation, and we came together for two days to kind of envision what might this convening look like and how might we plan as a community to invite about 80 folks into a room together in Boston to begin to talk about the state of the field, to begin to talk about our dreams and how do we really, uh, as a group, as, as a community, organize and advocate for the amazing work we have amongst us. Um, and that's the history and mission of the Latino Theater Commons. Will you read this one, one little thing? Oh, I'd be happy to, yeah. yeah. So we have um, a mission statement I should read for the uh, the HowlRound TV, hi folks, record. Um, so this is uh, our mission statement, what we are. The Latina Latino Theater Commons is a movement made up of passionate, articulate, driven Latina and Latino theater artists and scholars from across the country. The movement advocates for the Latina Latino theater as a vital, significant presence in the field. We are a think tank, a lobbying network, and a resource. We create nationally rec recognized events and sustain an online platform that creates and celebrates our diverse connections as well as promotes the quality and the quantity of our work. We honor our past with reflection and envision our future with optimism and enthusiasm. I love that um, because uh, Juliet Carrillo wrote that. Beautiful. <coughs> um. Hello. Uh, I thought you were. I thought, just thought you were going to keep just talking. Take the mic. I suddenly realized I shouldn't just take the mic. <laughs> no, you could. Uh, I think actually, Lisa, you're on next to talk a little bit about. What? You, you can't probably read my writing. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to be so subtle. I'm like, oh. The can uh, be. I'm, I'm going to uh, talk she, about. She the had written. What did you write that I thought was entonces? She wrote outcomes, and I said, oh, entonces. <laughs> So anyway, sorry. It's so uh, nobody can read my writing. Um, uh, thank you very much, Henry. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the convening itself. And there's many people in the room who are at the convening. Um, and so anything I don't say 
w- bring up in the Q&A afterwards, because, you know, we are recording live for HowlRound TV, and I want to make sure that we get everything into the record that we should get into the record. Um, the convening, it's so first of all, I just want to say, you have a bunch of materials that you may have gotten handed, do you? Have some of, some of you have them? If not, try to get them if you can. We made many copies. I made them color. Um, you have this one sheet, which is the Latino Lati- uh, Latina Commons, Theater Commons one sheet, which basically says, gives our mission, uh, how we're organized, what we intend to communicate, and our initiatives. There's also a Cafe Onda one sheet. And then there's a sheet that will give you the, a list of all the participants at the convening. And a sheet that will give you the current steering committee for the uh, LTC and the advisory committee. And just write in, when you get this, write in, advisory committee, write in Henry Godinez. And write in Chris Diaz, who I just, I just cajoled into being on the advisory committee <laughs> <laughs> over drinks <Yeah>. last night. <laughs> and I should also acknowledge that Chris was part of the original eight uh, when we all met uh, mm-hmm. and then got busy. But he's still, he's, he's on board. Uh, uh, okay, great. So the convening itself. Um, you know, one of the wonderful things that I just want to speak about is that we, uh, you know, when Anne talks about it, it all sounds very <coughs> official. When the eight of us met... Uh, we were like, well, well, we'll do all this stuff, yeah? And then, um, and HowlRound was like, okay, great. Uh, there's this grant, maybe write it. So then Tlaloc wrote it and the grant, and, and then we were like, yeah, well, we wrote a grant. <laughs> then we got the grant. And then we're like, oh, now we got to make a convening, <laughs> do you know? And so many of the things, the Encuentro, which is going to happen in 2014, the uh, Carnaval, which will happen at DePaul, it's stu- I just have be- I've become a powerful believer in speaking things out loud. Because when you start saying you're going to do it, that's how this whole thing formed. People just started saying they were going to do it, and then we called other people and said, hey, do you want to do this? We're doing this. And they're like, okay, well, we'll do it with you. But it's been a lot of talking about it. And then because it's out in the world, then one kind of has to do it. Um, The convening itself, there was about 75 participants at the convening. It was an intergenerational group. In other words, we had Luis Valdez, the founder of Teatro Campesino, and his son, Kinan. Valdez, who was uh, moderating. It was a beautiful, and then we had kids that were just out of their MFA programs, um, or didn't go to an MFA program. Um, uh, we had a real cross-section of generations. We also were multi, I, I don't want to say, I guess multicultural, but what I mean by that is we had Mexicans, we had Puerto Ricans, we had Colombians, we had Cubans, you know, we had a, a, a bunch of different, we, we were very, we, we, our diversity was represented in the room, as well as our aesthetic diversity, which was exciting. The purpose was really a couple, uh, we had a couple of purposes. One was to kind of create a magnetic center for the, for the Latino and Latina theater making community in the United States to actually put us in the same room. First time we've met since like 1980 something, since I was not even born. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, uh, th- uh, this was in some ways, you know, when the, uh, there had been a, uh, an initiative through South Coast Rep called Hispanic Playwrights Project that had been going on many, many years, uh, originally founded by uh, Jose, uh, Cruz Cruz, Jose Cruz Gonzalez and then taken over by Juliet Carrillo. And through that uh, HPP, we called it, many of us saw each other regularly once a year. Many of the Latino and Latina theater makers saw each other a lot. Um, at least once a year we could count on it. Um, and in, in that kind of informal setting, when we were all working, we were able to kind of take the temperature of the field, meet who was coming up, see what was going on, talk to each other, have drinks. Um, but it really was a hub. And when that died, it left, uh, uh, when South Coast Rep decided that they, 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 weren't, they uh, didn't need that programming anymore, um, it left a void. So there was still a lot and has been so much going on regionally around the country and locally, around, you know, locally, but there hadn't been a, a, a moment for uh, the community to come together. And so that was really the main purpose of the convening, was to get a real cross-section generationally, aesthetically, um, cult- culturally, uh, regionally of the country of Latino and Latino uh, theater artists together. So that was one, a magnetic center. Two, to take the temperature of the field, to really, we met in many, many different, Tanya knows, we met in many, many different groups. We met in, um, we had a creators meeting where the you know people, uh, writers and uh, divisors uh, were together uh, and talking about their experience of the field right now. We had an interpreters meeting, directors and actors were talking about their experience of the field right now. We had a producers meeting. We had a uh, pillars where it's like, you know, Jorge Huerta and Luis Valdez talking about their experience of the field in there. And then we had these conocimiento groups where like eight of us would get together and talk about what we thought. And then we had wisdom groups, which were by generation. So all, all the people in their 20s were together, all the people in their 30s were together, you know, we had those conversations. Then we had these big, we had a lot of conversation is what I'm trying to say, to talk about uh, the state of the field as it is right now, um, our wishes, 
uh, our dreams uh, and, what we, and what we imagine might be our future. Um, we discussed, we debate, we debated, we drank, we fought, it was good. Um, <laughs> uh, and finally, our intention was to really envision a future. Uh, how will we move this incredibly powerful historic moment forward? How would we keep this community connected uh, and moving forward? Um, the one of the biggest things that came out of the, this meeting, I'm going to talk about a couple of big things that came out of the meeting. There was a time, we created a timeline that started, I believe, in the 70s, am I right? Mm -hmm. 60s, 70s? 60s. So this was created by Jorge Huerta and uh, Juliet Carrillo. And you know, they put a couple of kind of milestones on that timeline. These are just milestones in Latino Latina theater in the United States. Um, and then everybody came and added. So all of us came and added our postcards, our, you know, our, um, our, our bills, our reviews, our you know, things like so-and-so got married to so-and-so. I mean, there was this amazing timeline. And you could see, this was what was interesting, you could see 60s, little drops, 70s, little drops, 80s, little more drops, 90s, pfft, 90s, suddenly, there was so much going on in the United States, 90s and then into 2000. And that visual image was incredibly powerful. And what it, tells, what it told us is that we were no longer speaking from a kind of politics of privation as a group, but actually speaking from, uh, in, to some extent, a mandate. Um, we all know that the population, the demographics of the United States are changing. We've all heard the stats at somewhere 2040, you know, where uh, uh, mixed, it, we're going to be more mixed than not. Yeah, the majority is going to be mixed culture. Um, and uh, I think we walked away with a mandate that as a group we needed to, um, we had a responsibility to push, to invite, to cajole, to charm, to demand the American theater to reflect uh, the changing population in a real, organic, and consistent way. Uh, and that's, that's really the kind of, I, I think, you know, all the initiatives come out of that idea. We discovered that we need more networking. We have all kinds of online platforms that we're going to talk about. We discovered that we need more ad advocacy. Um, but we also discovered that we, we have a responsibility as Latino and Latina theater making artists to, uh, to push the field forward. Um, and Luis Valdez at one point stood up and said, we are the new Americans. And it's on your little list, but I think what he means by that is, um, I gotta look at my notes. You know, the, the, Latin, the, the Latino and Latina experience is always at least bicultural at least bicultural, often tricultural, often many, many more cultures, yeah? And in a country that's moving to an increasingly mixed and uh, uh, ipso facto multinational multi, um, nation, uh, we are able to, as theater-making artists, to map uh, a new America, to kind of remap the American dramatic narrative. We tell stories from uh, the bi, tri, many cultured point of view already. I think that's why, you know, I, when Rock spoke last night and he said, you know, it wasn't that they planned for it to be, Marti you know, this Latino, you know, new play festival. It happened to be that Martin's play and Chris's play were the best plays they read. That's what I'm talking about. That the way we think as artists, the, the cultures that we navigate regularly, the way in which that changes our aesthetic and how we handle narrative and form is... It, 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 it provides a map for a way of thinking about what the American dramatic narrative is. And with that, uh, I will pass on to, who's next? Oh, Tlaloc. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'll start out with a little brief story about me. Um, I grew up in Watsonville, California, which is uh, uh, an agricultural community. It was also a polycultural community. It, it, was a, it was a community in a city defined by the waves of immigrants who came to work in the fields of Watsonville, California. And so, uh, you know, growing up, I never knew anything but uh, a, a sort of multicultural uh, community and society and friends that I had in high school that I got really close with. Uh, I also lived, uh, I realized, I discovered after high school that I lived 20 minutes from, from San Juan Bautista where at the Teatro Campesino is. So I actually got in my car and I drove over to Louis, Luis's uh, converted warehouse and I said, uh, I want to work for you and I want to learn from you. And they said, uh, okay, there's a broom, <laughs> there's a bucket with a mop, let's get to work. Uh, and so I did that. Um, I also, we, you know, Watsonville is, uh, you know, about half an hour south of the Silicon Valley. So uh, I, I, my, you know, my education and career and my livelihood has been intertwined with 
the rise of Silicon Valley and technology and Apple and uh, uh, certainly as I became a professional theater artist, uh, I have utilized and uh, been able to use technology as a tool. So one of the things that was very important for us mm -hmm. in terms of the convening was to uh, connect to all the regional uh, communities that have Latino theater from across the country. So we came up with uh, an idea of, of creating satellite groups to participate, to, to tune in to uh, HowlRound TV and watch the convening and also creating a sense of, of community online because we are in the 21st century and we have the ability to do that. Um, so we were able to set up satellites with, uh, with the help of Vijay, Vijay Matthew, and um, not, was it Olga that was helping organize this as well, Olga, Olga Sanchez? Mm -hmm. uh, so we set up satellite groups, and one of the, one of the days of the committee was dedicated to uh, live streaming uh, rooms and groups from all over the country, including Miami, and you were there in here in Chicago. Uh, we had Dallas, we had Los Angeles, we had New York, New York City. New York City. And Chicago um, was hosted by Goodman and Teatro Luna. And, and Teatro, Teatro Luna. Luna. Yeah. Here. Great. So um, it was this phenomenal experience. And we were, for those of us, uh, I, I don't know how it was for you guys in, in, at the satellites, but for us in Boston, seeing mm -hmm. the multiple rooms watching us and watching each other. It was a transformative moment. There was Dallas, there was New York, there was Chicago, yeah. and there was Miami, there was, you know, there, was these there was these screens with everybody on them. It was right. amazing. Cool. And all of us like listening and hearing about each specific, uh, e each specific community's uh, challenges and hopes and dreams for uh, the creation of Latino theater, how to reclaim the narrative in, on their stages, how to create more work, how to be more connected to each other. And so uh, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the online fl platform of Cafe Onda, but the satellite uh, is probably going to be a huge component moving forward uh, so that we remain con connected in these encuentros and carnivals and festivals. And also Twitter? And Twitter. Oh, and we Twitter. Trended. Yeah, and we'll trend we were the number one trending. Uh, really? Uh, for a while. For a while, for <laughs> a couple of days. Uh, then I think something happened. So we have a Twitter yeah. handle, and, yeah, and, 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 and people were able to use, uh, we used the Twitter handle Cafe Onda, and the idea came from La Buena Onda, which is, uh, you know, the Mexican <laughs> filmmakers, Guillermo del Toro, Iniratu, and I'm trying to think of the other guy's name. I can't think of him. But anyway, uh, but it, it means a, a way forward, a movement forward, and that's how the, uh, that's how the, and we love cafe, so we, <laughs> <laughs> so it made sense to create an online cafe where people can can get together and discuss. But I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But I want to awesome. move forward. And uh, yeah. Ricardo, hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it was a, an incredible experience that was, uh, by the way, hosted by Emerson College, um, uh, where where Jaime works. Is that right? She works for she works she, for HowlRound through, through Arts through Arts, yeah. So Emerson College was uh, was an incredible host uh, for us. We uh, participated in um, a black box their black box theater, and uh, I'm happy to say that that Chicago was very well represented uh, with not uh, Teatro Vista. I was there, of course, and and uh, Sandra Delgado and Sandra Marquez were there from Teatro Vista, but also representing Chicago were um, the Urban Theater, mm -hmm. uh, Teatro Luna, and um, El um, Mm -hmm. So we were very well represented, and not only, and, and Tanya was there <laughs> representing Tanya Saracho. Yeah, uh, uh, and, and there were other uh, um, uh, people from uh, other organizations and in the Midwest, and Al Alta, I'm going to yeah. talk about Alta in a little Diane bit. Was um, uh, Elaine was there, Elaine, Diane was yeah, there, uh, yeah. so we were very, very well represented. Uh, not only in Chicago and in the Midwest, and um, so we were able to not only uh, participate and give our ideas, but exchange ideas and bring them back to Chicago, which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit um, the next time around. Um, at these type of, of convenings, uh, there is a lot of talk and ideas tossed around and all, uh, but I, I know that I was... Um, by the second day, I said, okay, all well, this is great, this is great, but do we just walk away and say, well, that was a great experience? Um, where's the commitment and the follow-through? And, and it was uh, very well planned and executed. Uh, we were all given a uh, Loteria card, 
uh, early on, and uh, we didn't know what the Loteria card was, uh, but it was there. And at the end of the convening, towards the end, um, we uh, talked about pillars for the future of what we can do and should do now that we have synthesized a lot of ideas. And rather than just saying, okay, the ideas are there, each of us was uh, asked to uh, commit to following through with at least one of those actionable steps and signing it on the back of our Loteria card and depositing it into a basket at the end in front of everyone in silence. And everyone's saying, yes, here, I'm throwing down this card and throwing down my energy and my positiveness and, and everything that I've gathered here and will continue to gather and harvest to make certain that these actionable steps are, are done. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's all on paper. So there's going to be a follow through and an accountability, which I loved because um, as I said, a lot of times there's just a lot of talk and then um, no follow through. So, mm -hmm. so that was wonderful. Uh, I do want to mention that there was a, uh, uh, this was over uh, Halloween, All Saints, the other Los Muertos uh, weekend. Uh, so we had uh, an ofrenda. Uh, that we all offered a, uh, a gift to the ofrenda at the beginning, and at the end of the convening, we uh, took our gift from the uh, altar and then passed it on to uh, someone who had participated, and we, each of us was given one as well. Um, and, and I'm mentioning that because I would like to um, read a reflection. We were all asked to, uh, to, to write a reflection about our experience there. And I'd, I'd like to uh, read the reflection that I wrote, because uh, I didn't know what I was going to write. I said, how in the world can you absorb all of this uh, that, that we just experienced in, uh, what were we given, 500 words or something or other? And, and um, I, I've written maybe two poems in my life, this one and one other one. <laughs> and this one just came. But I, I would like to read it, indulge, uh, indulge me, and I'd like to read it, because it does reflect a lot of the activity and a lot of the future, mm -hmm. if so, if I may. This is what I submitted. And there are a lot of references to what uh, was presented here. I was invited to walk on golden streets. Boston, a city which Emerson wrote, uh, old Europe groans, open its strong Anglo arms and welcome Latinos and Latinas <laughs> to a convening, a common a creation. Day one, I step into the black box, the golden streets. Old European groans are drowned by the laughter of the new Americans. Legacy and future fills the room. The golden sun of California, the golden sun of Florida, the golden sun of the Aztec gods, of the mighty Taino, of the Mayans, of the Incas, the golden sun that nurtures our shared genes. The creators, the interpreters, the designers, the actors, the scholars mix, collide, embrace, and merge. We come with an offering to the altar of our ancestors, a photo here, a book there, a hat, a program, a shirt, rice, a spinning top, each with its own story, each with its own penetrating emotion. And now we drink, we eat, mm. we connect. Day two, conocimientos in circles. If experience is the best teacher, it sits in the room. Information is tossed, mutual struggles, celebrated wins, visionary ideas. The buzzing energy from my conocimiento is almost drowned by the surging roar of the others. This is the howl round. Share to share, comfort. Circles and outer circles are formed. As we weave in and out of our musical chairs, we listen, we absorb, we digest. A legend talks about heritage. A pioneer speaks of a movement and its growth. A young voice asks a question. We talk of the past, of goals, of needs, of the future. Day three, strategy and next steps. Loteria cards become amulets. We eagerly rush to fill our tablas. El soldado, the soldiers who marched before us. La estrella, the mentors who guide us. El árbol, the knowledge that we share and cultivate. La rosa, the sweetness of nature, of poetry, of theater, of art. El sol, the muscular sun that emblazed these golden streets. We reach beyond the naked brick wall of this black box and stream to Miami, New York, Dallas, Los Angeles, and sweet home Chicago, to the outer reaches of this new America, where tributaries are explored, where flags are planted, where blood is drawn, where the seeds and the harvest support us all. Talk becomes action. We commit to each other and ourselves. 
In silence, we sacrifice our amulets and gift our offerings. 2045 is upon us. It is within us. It carries pride, responsibility, and accountability. There are many before you and after you, but today it is you. Today you tell your story. Lift the power and the possibilities. Discover. Stand in witness. Give voice to the stories. Sing the songs. Dance the rhythm of our forefathers. Walk on golden streets. This, this flow just captured what was there with us the entire weekend. And there was no sign that said, leave your ego at the doors. Because I don't think they were even brought to Boston, so you couldn't leave it at the door. And we walked these golden streets, and we invite all of you to walk the golden streets with us. Awesome. That's beautiful. Thank you, Ricardo. Yeah. OK. Um, Anne, um, would you like to talk a little bit about, um, about the about yeah, the encuentro. The encuentro. Yeah, thank you. That was beautiful, Ricardo. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so just really briefly. Um, so our next uh, event is going to be in the fall of 2014 in Los Angeles. It's going to be. It's called El Encuentro, the Encounter. It'll be 10 companies from around the country coming to Los Angeles to present their work to one another in a three to four week period. <laughs> so it'll be an amazing sharing of new works. One work per company. 10 companies. One theater three to four weeks. Um, so it'll be about aesthetics, seeing what's, what the field is offering right now. And also, it'll be a chance to have what we call tertulias, so discussions. We'll be, we'll be hosting each day discussions about aesthetics, about the field, about art making, about how do we as communities come together and support these companies. Um, and that will be taking place, like I said, at, at LATC. And I want to mention um, Jose, Jose Luis Valenzuela is the director of LATC, as well as Chantal Rodriguez is, is his um, mighty associate there. And they're going to be helming the efforts in LA and will be coming together there and really want it to be a, a community-wide event. So whereas Boston was a small event uh, of about 75 due to our grant uh, recommendations, this is going to be a much larger, expansive conversation, sharing of work, and really so we can encounter, encuentro um, those folks who are making work across the country. Great. And, and are there kind of uh, ballpark dates for that? Um, Help me out here, folks. October. I think October, yeah, October, October. 2014. Okay. And this is for Latino um, companies or individual artists that could apply, companies. and there's a process to... Right. They're, they're actually going to be for companies, and so right now the steering committee is forming a um, committee to begin to select the pieces and to put the call out to the, to the uh, world, I guess. So um, that's right in process as we speak. Um, but the idea is that um, people will submit um, proposals, and then they'll choose 10 companies to bring work to L.A. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so these are the outcomes. These are now we're talking a little bit more specifically about some of these action steps that Ricardo was talking about. Tolok, y did you uh, want to talk a little about about? Uh, oh no, maybe it's Lisa. I'm okay, sorry. First right. about these the carnaval. The entonces. These are the entonces. Entonces. <laughs> um, uh, and I should say, yeah, these are the entonces. Um, uh, I should say, you know, the the interesting thing about the encuentro is that it's LATC is hosting it and they're shouldering it. But the selection committee will be Latino Latina Theater Commons. So it'll be made up of kind of four members of the steering committee that will select the pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, I mean, this is a commons approach, and you're going to see it throughout, uh, when I, and I'm going to move to the carnival. But I also wanted to mention something that I, uh, it's important to know that the 75 people that were at this convening and those that were representing in the satellite groups are delegates, are delegates to our communities. Um, uh, and that anybody who wants to join up should like let people know, because the commons is a commons. Anybody can be involved. It's not, there's not a club. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a commons. So the Carnaval. Well, it was originally a festival, but then we had a meeting. My wisdom group was it? No, we were the Loteria cards. It was the Loteria cards talking about festivals, and I was saying, okay, there's a bunch of playwrights in this room. You do these all the time. Like, what would you like to see? And Tanya and Elaine started talking about, well, you know, at uh, Victory Gardens when they did that first ignition, there was such this kind of sense of energy. It was like a carnival, and I was like, oh, a Carnaval. So we decided to make a Carnaval of New Work that will be hosted by the Theater School at DePaul University, um, but will be produced by the Latino Latina Theater Commons. Um, and in this event, there will be eight pieces 
Two from the north, two from the south, two from the east, two from the west. We're big on the four directions. Uh, eight pieces. They might be plays or they might be devised pieces that will be presented in reading format or if it's a devised piece, whatever the um, equivalent would be of uh, reading format. Um, there will also be three master directors that are brought in, three Latino. We wanted to make sure we were representing directors as well as writers. So three directors being brought in from around the country who will direct a group of, um, each gr direct a group of students, DePaul students, uh, and in a 15 minute devised piece. So those will be shown. And then we're gonna have booths. And the booths are Teatro Luna has a booth, Teatro Vista has a booth, uh, cafe, um, Urban Theater has a booth. And a booth is basically, hey, you can use, the, these are the public spaces, you can do whatever you want in this time frame. It might be a 24 hour theater event, it might be um, uh, a playwright slam, it might be uh, an installation, I don't know, it's up to each of the uh, organizations here in Chicago. And then we're gonna have a bobbing for scripts <laughs> we wanted to make sure that people had access to the scripts or maybe the, you know, whatever the video is from devised pieces. We want to maybe, this is right now and we're thinking about this, but put everything on flash drives, all the finalists, you know, for this on flash drives and then have a place you know, where we bob for scripts. So everybody can walk away with the work itself. Yeah, so it's not just something you see. And those are some of the ideas around the carnival, but the whole idea is we're going to take over the theater school and like run amok in that fabulous new building mm -hmm. and make some really amazing work happen. That's going to be the, uh, probably in July. Um, and we are um, hoping, you know, to partner with, um, uh, with the Goodman and also with uh, Victory Gardens because, you know, they may be running Ignition at the same time. There may be something running here at the same time. And so we hope to get, like, little trolley buses. It'll be a good thing. So Chicago, you know, as, as Ricardo said, Chicago really emerged. There was a lot of us there. And we really emerged as a, you know, there's L.A. In terms of there's L.A. on the west, there's Chicago in the Midwest, and there's New York and Washington. Uh, in the East Coast and then of course Miami, but we really, you know, uh, we, I think the Carnival will help kind of at the heart and kind of in the heartland of the country keep the beat going and we hope it will be a biannual festival of new work. So, so Lisa, um, so the booths, would they be specifically for Chicago companies? Yes. Yeah. Um, but the scripts or the projects national. The eight could be national. Yeah, so the scripts okay. will be national. And the director's national. Yeah, the script's national, the eight pieces will be national, um, and then the, the directors will be national, and then the booths will be local. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Tlaloc? Yes. Now, uh, <laughs> talk a little bit about Café Onda. All right, Café Onda. This is what you came here for, right? Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, Café. So there's two ways to find us, which is we already have a website. It's cafeonda.com. But we also are linked to HowlRound. So if you go to, if most of you who are theater artists are already maybe hooked up as, uh, have HowlRound as your homepage. If you don't, please do. Um, but we have a little hyperlink that, that lists all the articles and blogs and journal entries uh, related to uh, everything that happened with the, um, the um, Encuentro in Boston, but also for, uh, it's to keep everyone updated about uh, how to find out more information regarding these future um, events. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what we are, and I'll read a little bit from the mission, which is that we are an online platform of Latino Theater Commons that serves as a digital hub for community and conversations about the current state of Latino theater in the 21st century. Café Onda contains articles, blogs, and live streaming of theater events, and is linked to HowlRound, an online journal of the theater commons. And using a commons-based approach, we have created an online mechanism for community source contributions and feedback through Café Onda. And the idea behind this, and this was really important, um, we wanted to create and connect geographically and artistically isolated Latino artists, very much so that I, I, f in the past we've been because of the loss of the annual, um, you know, new play initiatives that happened in the late 90s into the 2000s, uh, there wasn't really a way to get together. And so we wanted to create a 24-7 presence where we can continually connect with each other. Uh, we wanted to promote deeper dialogue with, with non-Latinas and increase cultural understanding about who we are as artists. Uh, we wanted to be able to quickly address misrepresentations of our, cultural, of our cultures on stage, both intentional and unintentional. Uh, we wanted to inspire powerful, diverse Latino voices in the polis of American theater, including greater access to productions and leadership positions. And we wanted to broaden the recognition of a canon of Latino theater. Um, and some of the things that, uh, that in, in terms of what we're looking for, in terms of what, what kind of material you want to post on Café Ona, is pretty much, it's wide open at the moment. I mean, Ricardo, I want to post your, your poem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as as yeah. as part of uh, as part of the essay, yeah. 
Um, Thank you. I know that uh, there are several individuals here who have come up to me who said they uh, they would love to write something, and you're more than you're more than welcome to. Uh, we want to open it up to also, uh, you know, non-Latinos to, to talk about Latino work because we are sort of examining our, our aesthetic and our field and what we're trying to say now in the 21st century. Um, and some of the questions that came up and really uh, some of the things that we're looking at right now is what is Latinidad exactly, whether it's hemispheric or it's uh, Iberian-based, and what does it mean? And is there an aesthetic that we can define and share that isn't tied or defined by a dominant culture's dramaturgy? How are we to promote and share that work with the next generation of Latino artists? How are we supporting structures to develop new work? How can senior Latino theater makers be encouraged to mentor emerging artists? So we want to make that information uh, available and, uh, and clear to, to folks who visit our website. Um, some of the current initiatives right now as we are continually to develop uh, a presence is we're developing an editorial board. So uh, we intend to have several members of, uh, from, around the from around the country, scholars, academics, uh, working professionals to, uh, be, uh, to serve uh, on the editorial board to envision and build a website. Uh, we want to establish Café Onda as a self-sustaining, standalone sister site to HowlRound. So right now we're connected to HowlRound, uh, but at some point we are currently trying to raise funding to so we can have a standalone site. Uh, we also, we're trying to promote the use of the hashtag Cafe Onda on Twitter. And that is a big, huge thing that happened dur during the conference. And also, uh, whenever anything that happens uh, related to Latino theater, we want people to go on Twitter and use the hashtag Cafe Onda uh, to talk about those issues. And I'm getting the, uh, the five minute morning mark. Mm. Uh, uh, but if you want, <laughs> yeah, I know. Is it super? Okay, yeah. so uh, if you want to pitch or if you want to get in touch with us, uh, you can send it to two, mail, two email addresses, cafeonda at howround.com or editor at cafeonda.com. So those two places. Great, thank you. Thanks. Ricardo? Yes, very briefly. Uh, but first, uh, three people have explained hashtag to me, and I still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so please help me. Just grab me and try to. It's try a to it's a way of connect, <laughs> It's a way of connecting the narrative no, 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 thread. I, no, I know what the hashtag is, and I've heard explanations. And I still don't know. Uh, <laughs> at, at any rate, um, the future for for. Um, uh, uh, theater here in Chicago, with uh, I can only speak for, with the Atro Vista at this point, I'll say it real quickly, that, that we are participating in um, something that came uh, to our attention at uh, the Commons uh, 3030 project, uh, headed by Caridad uh, Svich, mm -hmm. and uh, we are now looking at plays that were submitted by playwrights generously, uh, four or five of whom are in this room, and uh, the idea is to have 30 play readings over 30 days, and we're, we're committing to three or four where uh, the venues can be almost anywhere, uh, giving credit to the playwrights and, of course, uh, the, the commons and HowlRound, and uh, recording uh, five minutes of it at least. So uh, things like that I know are going to be going on uh, all over the states and certainly here in Chicago with, with the Atra Vista as well. Um, uh, Tanya Sinatra and I hubbubbed uh, right away uh, when we got back full of energy and talked about how Alta uh, could get involved. Alta is an organization that Tanya and I founded uh, here in Chicago, uh, standing for uh, Alliance of Latino Theater, uh, Latino Latina Theater Artists uh, in Chicago. And uh, we're a service organization that helps to promote, foster, mentor uh, theater artists here in Chicago. And we have scheduled right now a, a town hall meeting. Uh, where we're going to call for all Latinos here in Chicago, artists, uh, to meet uh, on January the 11th and uh, have a convening of our own. Uh, we'll be talking about what happened in Boston and sharing that as well, but also sharing the ideas that we have and seeing how we can devise some actionable steps and proceed with them. Uh, in addition, Alta is also having a, a December winter social gathering on December the 29th, so be on the lookout for that. You can get it on uh, Facebook or at Alta. What, what, what is our um, uh, uh, website address? Alta what? Dot org? 
altachicago.org. So uh, look for that. And uh, many, many more exciting things, but uh, we're going to open the floor, I think, at this point. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Close, I gotta talk about the Fornest Center really quickly. Please. This is gonna be mm -hmm. very, very fast. This is an idea that came out of one of the wisdom groups uh, when we were talking about like, we need something like the O'Neill Institute. We need like our own, like there's an O'Neill thing, why we need something. And somebody said, it was actually Lou Moreno, Moreno said it should be the Fornest Center. And so there, this is a 10, this is a long-term initiative, you know, it's a long-term initiative, but we're committed to the idea of creating the Maria Irene Fornest Center for the Advancement of Latino Latina Theater um, within the next decade, short and sweet. Fabulous, thank you. On, on that note, we'd love to open it up for any questions, and then uh, as we go along, we'll also take some questions or comments that come via Twitter and hashtag and all that stuff. <laughs> okay, so, um, any, any questions, comments? Don't be shy. Oh, Sandra, we're gonna give you a microphone so it'll um, be uh, on the... Um, as someone who attended, it was such an amazing weekend, and I think the thing that struck me the most, actually there were two things, and one was the idea of mentorship, and how we were asked to uh, not leave Boston without uh, getting in contact with someone that you would like to mentor, or that you would like mm -hmm. them to mentor you. And what I found amazing about the weekend is that I'd looked to my left, and there was Luis Valdez, and I thought, man, I'm in this room with this legend, and that makes me feel so young. And then I'd look over and I'd see some kid and I'd think, that makes me feel so old. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but what I found is that I wanted my mentors to be people who are younger than I am because I feel like there's so much to learn in this idea of cross-generational learning mm -hmm. I find so exciting. Mm -hmm. The other thing that really, I, for me, lit a fire under me was uh, when this amazing woman named Olga Garay got up to speak, and she's a funder, not a not an artist, and she was talking about, she stood up and she said, yeah, it's really great that you guys are touchy-feely and talking about your artist stuff, but you really, as a, somebody who's been funding for a long time, you need to understand the numbers. And the numbers are that of the monies that go to nonprofits, 2% go to Latino causes. And that 2%, 2, includes education, health and the arts. Mm. So you can imagine how much we get, especially smaller guys like, you know, of course, I'm thinking Teatro Vista and everyone else who's, who's small. And I really thought, my God, and Lou Morena was talking about how we have to change that. Mm -hmm. we ha it's no longer about please help us, it's we are the new Americans. It is now time for uh, the American theater landscape to reflect that we are Americans. Mm -hmm. We're part of it, so thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. Any other questions, comments? Isaac, anything on Twitter? Yes. <coughs> so we, we do have a question from Twitterverse. Uh, this comes from Alexander Krapivkin. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And uh, this person's question is, do you potentially see Cafe Onda supporting other ethnicities in America to step up and create their own work in theater? Awesome. Can I jump in and give it to you, Tlaloc? Yeah, I mean, I know that HowlRound's mission is ideally they have, we have m a bunch of these, do you know what I mean? I mm -hmm. mean, eventually there's, the, there's a Latino group and there's any other group that they're kind of working with, but uh, I think HowlRound is hoping to foster communities mm -hmm. as a commons. And then ideally, maybe we're all one big group. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, what about Cafe Onda? I mean, in, in, in terms of the, the genesis of Cafe Onda, I, I, I feel like we're in inextricably linked to, to many other different initiatives that have emerged in the past several, um, um, past couple of years, actually, like 50-50 in 2020, which is to have, uh, you know, half our plays uh, produced on stages by, written by women, and also the Asian American, um, uh, Theater Alliance, which has uh, slowly but surely been growing in terms of their vocal demonstrations against uh, stereotypes on uh, in Asian work uh, and yeah. and more diversity uh, on New York stages as well. So um, I feel like we're we're partners in that cause to to reflect the diversity uh, of 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 our country on our stages and our stories and our narratives. Um, and I think uh, there's room for that, definitely. Fantastic. Thank you. Any other questions? Juan? We're going to get you a mic, Juan. So, everybody. Um, 
I guess my question is, uh, going by the last time there was a, a joining, 1987, was 86. it? 86. 86. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wish I could hear, I wish I knew what was said then of, mm -hmm. this is what we envision in the future, because I'd be curious if we are in a very good place or if we're very behind. So I guess to, to then jump it forward, I'm curious with you guys, if we went ahead, what is that? So if that was like maybe 15 years from now, mm. where would you guys, mm to put it out there, to, as, as you said earlier, where do you guys uh, look at it as to say, that would be a great place to be? What about mm -hmm. you? In other words, what do you think in 15 years? What would you like to see? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, no, we're, because it's not, no, we're not, we're not the, like, you know, it's a commons. We're not like, you know, you no, know what I mean? Well, I mean, we talked, when, uh, when you had that first, the DePaul one, where mm -hmm. I think it was before you left for the, for the mm -hmm. summit. Um, we're gonna take over Dominic's. I, uh, yeah, that's <laughs> right. Space, space is available now. Yes. Oh, it's gonna be Mariano's. Uh, I just heard about that. Uh, but uh, just inside information. But um, uh, I would say I would say is the is the freedom for Latino artists to just be an artist, you know, and not not have obviously that tag of being Latino. It's gonna be we are artists, and therefore there's a free free range of everyone making financially living off of. Uh, being an artist. So for me, that's a, I know I talked about that that time of, mm -hmm. we're in a different place now than from 15 years ago, where now we financially there's more theaters involved who are producing more Latino work, and therefore you can, you can live comfortably, mm -hmm. and then you wanna continue living. You don't wanna drop down. And I'd hope that 15 years from now, it gets just even bigger, and the funding, that's the 2% that was just shared by Sandra, is a lot higher. Mm -hmm. So that more, there's more going out to the people that, that deserve it, and I, I think I'd love for it to continue of just Latino work being like more opportunities for Latino directors and then even for Latino work to be directed by people maybe who are not Latino, mm -hmm. just for a different perspective mm -hmm. uh, on the work. So that's my first th impulse of wh what I look at. It doesn't sound so grand, I guess. No, it's great. <laughs> but and what it's, what's interesting is if I, you know, I just came out of a meeting with Henry and uh, Rock recently and I think that the, you know, the Goodman Theater, what I love about what's happened is they, you know, had been doing this festival for a while but then have moved into the idea of, well, we don't just want to give the impression that we do our Latino theater in a festival in the summer, you know, but we want to integrate, you know, throughout the season. And if you look at this festival that wasn't even intended to be a Latino festival, it just happened to be because Chris and Martin rocked the plays, um, that really that's what the world looks like, you know, that the world is always already taken for granted multicultural, mm -hmm. you know, always already. Yeah, that's what I would like to see in 15 years, you know. And a lot, and where the leadership, I think, where the leadership of the theaters, we've got great leadership right now on the TCG and on ATTA, you know, the, the leaders are all Latino actually right now, Diane Rodriguez with TCG and um, Patricia, Patricia Barra. Barra with uh, ATTA. But in the theaters themselves where you see a real mix of uh, people from many backgrounds running the theaters, because I think when that happens you're gonna see already the stories reflecting the rest of the nation. But until that happens, I don't know that we will. Good point. Good, thank you Juan. Any other questions? Yes. Godless will get you a... Hey, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm not going to do any karaoke, but... Um, Please. So, so I, I feel like uh, that the artistic side and the, the, the work side is re well represented. I'm curious what kind of conversations came up in terms of outreach to the at uh, for attending the, the communities that actually need Audiences. to see these works. Like what, what initiatives, what thoughts came out of that comment in terms of like all the, all the people who come to see the shows that I am I'm in are usually fellow artists mm -hmm. or people with, who are, have a little bit more education and wealth that are able to go out and, and, and have access to, to, to these works. I mean, the, the, the new stages is great because it's all free, but in terms of outreach to make, to make sure that the, the people who need to see these works to experience these stories like, what, what is, is, did anything come up out of the comments to kind of address that? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. What were there conversations, um, Sandra? Sandra, let's get you the mic again so all the world can hear you. Oh. Um, I think that's a really great question and it certainly came up in, in some of our groups as discussion. Um, one of the things that came up was the fact that um, we are products now, especially younger generation, of Reagan economics. And that because the arts started getting cut, our culture 
in general, not just Latino culture, but all of the American culture is not being exposed to the arts the way it was before. So we aren't training audiences mm -hmm. like we used to. And so we did talk about that, that we can't look at ourselves as being in a vacuum, but that we are part of the larger landscape. Um, and some of the groups were talking about, oh, um, real women have curves, Josefina Lobos, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, was talking about how in Boyle Heights, she is in that community and really working to train to uh, train even the little kids how to produce their own work so that they grow up to be theater artists and how it's a real community involvement. I found that exciting. I found that what Jesus Reyes is doing uh, mm -hmm. with East LA Rep, yeah, yeah, is amazing how he's involving the community. And it, he no longer, they no longer call it a, a theater company. They are a community group that happens to do some theater. And so f for me, I found it inspiring that there are different ways to look at it, that we aren't just artists, but we are members of a community and a country. And That's Sandra, w so was that around the particular question of audience development and, and it creating? It came up within the conversation about, um, it wasn't necessarily audience development, but I, I, I honestly, there were so many different small groups that we broke into, I but can't remember which one it yeah. was in particular. It access. may have been access, mm -hmm. and I think we also talked Regina about- Regina Garcia. Uh, we also talked a lot about um, a mutual concern for companies all over the country, which I was relieved to hear, the difficulty sometimes of getting Latino board members, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. because they tend to want to go to the bigger theater companies and not work so much with the smaller companies. Mm -hmm. And I was really uh, relieved to hear that it wasn't just a Teatro Vista issue, but it was an issue across the country. This it's is such right. a great thing, I just want to jump in on this, because um, uh, Luis Alfaro, of course, you know, does so much work whenever he's working on a play. He goes right out into the community. He doesn't, he goes out to the box office and he talks to everybody at the box office and he goes out into the community. He talked about what he does when he shows up. He does a lot <laughs> of legwork <laughs> in order to, and uh, he does a lot of legwork in order to create a bridge to create a br bridge to communities that may not have had access, may not feel welcome, may not feel comfortable. Um, uh, and I think, you know, I thought about that and I was up at Milwaukee Rec basically because they wanted to talk to me about how can they increase their Latino audiences, you know, which they should do and I'm really excited. And I said, well, you got it, you know, you need to get people up there, Tanya's in town, you got to, and people, we have to go out into the community because, you know, you can't have, you know, you know I don't know who, uh, outreach person who's not Latino go into a Spanish-speaking community. You know what I mean? We need to go into the communities um, uh, in order to create bridges, I think. I think, that's the, I think that's the first step because often, you know, in places, not so much here, but like Milwaukee Rep, it's really, he said, you know, we don't want to just, want to just be the kind of great white theater. We want to be Milwaukee Rep, you know, and so... I think part of it is, I think it's a little bit on us because we are, you know, we are Latinos and we are theater people. So did you ask them what their staff looks like and what their <laughs> artistic, uh, I, well, no. Yeah, no, I did. be a good question? <laughs> I did, I did And ask. then maybe oh. even follow up with, you know, what does your own backyard look like? Alvaro is here from Milwaukee, yeah. right. you know? Yeah. Um, you and know, I think that we have to maybe sometimes seize those opportunities as educational opportunities, you know? There's also, like, I, just to bring up a couple of examples, uh, there was another example that came up with uh, Elisa Alvarado, who's the artistic director of Teatro Vision, and to kind of like turn everything upside down, they have moved away from the subscription model or producing a season model and really focusing in on doing very specific projects. Uh, and they did that for the first time with Macario, which was a world premiere by uh, an adaptation of the B. Traven novel uh, adapted by Evelina Fernandez, and it was their biggest selling show. And they think that is the model that that works for them because they can actually target the specific show and put all their resources behind the show and target the specific community. Mm -hmm. and the other thing is, is that, especially, you know, for those of us who have been freelance Latino artists, there's never been a, you know, a time where we haven't been asked, well, how do we reach out to the Latino community? That's, That's always right. in our back of our minds. Right. Like, uh, I have never, like the, the Luis Valdez quote, if, the, if, the, if people don't come to the theater, theater has to go out to the people. That has always been like my mantra. So when I'm doing like, what about the spoonful in Iowa, you know, it is my endeavor and initiative to go out and reach out to all the Latinos within the Iowa City region to, to come and experience this work because it is an opportunity to see themselves on, st on, on stage, to see their stories. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and Chris Diaz with this, uh, I don't, sorry, I don't mean to use you, Chris, but, you know, every time you, like early on when you were, like, talking to theaters and, like, they're asking you, like, how do you reach out to, like, younger communities, hip-hop community, 
uh, Latino community to come out and see your shows, it's, it's like pulling teeth sometimes because you can't do this with like one shot, one show. You have to, yeah, be, right. you have to make a commitment to, mm -hmm. to, to, to develop and, and produce the work mm -hmm. annually. Do we have any time? Can I say one more thing? We have a couple of minutes. I just want to say one more thing on that. It was interesting, and, and, and the gentleman that I spoke to in Milwaukee Rep was great. He was lovely, and I think the commitment was real. I think there, you know, it's, uh, uh, one thing that I hope the Latino Theater Commons does is also serve as a resource for folks who want to kind of change how they're doing stuff. I mean, he's like, well, you know, we want to do it, but we're afraid we're going to do it wrong, so we haven't done it yet. And I'm like, okay, well, you will do it wrong, but you should still do it. And then, you know, he's like, well, and, you know, we got to find the right time. I said, well, yeah, the, it's like having a baby. There's, your, you know, you just got to jump, and it's scary. <laughs> it's scary. But I think, you know, how can we also, looking, you know, help, helping audiences, but how can we help theater makers who have the right, have the intention, but are unfamiliar, uh, uncomfortable, not sure, a little timid, you know, how can we serve as a resource to them as well? Yes, a question over here. Uh, Sandra and Henry touched on the idea of people who aren't artists supporting, you know, whether it's a funder or people who are working in administrative roles or administrative mm -hmm. artistic roles. And one thing that I'd be curious about is whether there's been any conversation about ways that allies, which I know is such a like word, you know, a word, a word, mm -hmm. um, allies, uh, theater workers who maybe aren't artists can commit and support the mm -hmm. mission you guys are talking about because mm -hmm. what you guys are doing is at the crossroads of the theater community and the Latino community. You're talking about how to engage the Latino community, but I think there's also the theater community mm -hmm. and I think that's a great resource. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious to know if that's been a conversation you guys have been having. Mm -hmm. I'll just jump in really quickly. Um, for our convening, we had a number of committees that were responsible for the planning, the programming, the outreach, and the fundraising. And so we really called upon folks with expertise in the community in those specific areas, and that really helped us make this event happen. So I think it's on everyone's minds to how do we pool our resources and how do we reach out to folks who may not be either artists or scholars, but may have development experience, staff experience, et cetera, to really kind of come together and empower us as, as a whole. So we have them that sum up we really want to do more of that. That's great. Yes, Isaac? We have, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh my goodness, these chairs, y'all. <laughs> so we have one more question from the Twitterverse. Okay. Um, this is from Maricela Trevino Horta. Oh, Maricela! Maricela. And this is, I think this is a great question to, to sort of culminate the, this, this convening, and um, the question is, what about radical hospitality, making theater accessible financially to people who may not otherwise have mm -hmm. those available experiences? Mm -hmm. Henry? <laughs> <laughs> the Goodman will pay for it all. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just kidding, Rock, honestly. <laughs> no, there he goes. Say it and it, it happens. Goes my life you it. <laughs> no, you know, uh, the, the truth is when during the Latino Theater Festival, um, our ticket prices are much reduced. And, and I think at the Goodman, we've come to understand that over the years, you know, that when you are developing an audience, you need to make sure that they feel welcome in every way, not only in what you put on stage, but the way they're treated from the moment they walk in the door to the price, you know. Um, because, you know, here at the Goodman, if you want to pay $65 for a ticket, you can do that. But if you're not used to doing that, it's shocking. Mm -hmm. So so definitely, I think that, that uh, you know, you need to be aware of that. And look at how high our prices are for new stages this weekend. <laughs> and they're sold out. So, you know, um, and I think that, that once you begin to develop that audience, then, you know, you can begin to you know, negotiate those prices, but I absolutely think it's important. I just loved Mixed Blood's kind of call to arms on HowlRound, I think it was two weeks ago, right, which is like everybody can do a week, you know, right. maybe everybody, maybe not, but you know, can you mm -hmm. do a week where it's free, where it's just right. free and anybody can or come. What you can pay what you, know, you can. Or pay what you can, do you know, I mean, I just think that idea of a week, a weekend, you know, two performances, <clears> something, do you know, so that, uh, that idea of radical hospitality, I think is crucial. Radical hospitality. Well, I've been asked to, to wrap this up, and since we've invoked his name several times, Luis Valdez, I just a quick anecdote that I think uh, is perfect for where we are. When we did Zoot Suit 10, 12 years ago at the old Goodman, it was the last production at the old Goodman, 
And I'll never forget opening night, Luis Valdez took me aside at the party. He's like, Henry, don't let this be like it was when I was a child growing up, you know, um, in the fields and where they would only let us uh, Mexican kids swim in the swimming pool, the public pool, the day before they drained it. And I was like, oh, oh, oh you know? <laughs> I thought, oh, because this is the last show at the old Goodman. Mm. You know, and, uh, and I, it really scared the crap out of me um, when he said that. And, but now I sit here and I look at new stages. I look at the work on our stages this weekend, you know, by all these amazing playwrights, Latino playwrights that mostly just happen to be the best plays that Tanya, you know, wanted to showcase in this, in this festival. And I think, well, there you go. The pool is open 24-7 to everybody. So. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um.